Well, welcome to you all. My name is Lindsay Douglas. This is part two of a three-part series brought to us by Agricultural Shows Australia. And amongst many of their ambitions and obligations as the national entity looking after the nearly 600 shows in Australia, they have a massive focus on the next generation. And one of the areas that has been identified as a need for young people coming up through into leadership roles or on committees, um, or just wanting to prosper in the show movement, because shows change lives, as our dear friend Marla Calico says in uh, USA at IAFI. Um, we want to make sure that you're in the best possible position when you join a committee, whether it's at a local show or your local race committee, uh, race club, or whether it's in um, another community organisation, your local CWA, all the way through to being on the state bodies and, and even the federal body here, that you know how to contribute, you know how to be true to your values, and you understand some of the basics uh, of your obligations being on those committees. So we've been enormously fortunate to have great speakers. And last week, if you joined us, you would have seen the great Catherine Marriott OAM just dropping nuggets of gold everywhere. Uh, and Jock Laurie, the chairman of Australian Wool Innovation, uh, who's been chairman of National Farmers Federation, uh, the New South Wales Farmers and so many other groups, including drought and water bodies. So dealing with some of the most complex issues in agriculture. And he was really uh, candid and honest with us last week about what he recommends you all should know heading into these roles. This week, we're gonna do a bit of a focus on governance. It won't be terribly dry, but we just wanna deal with some of the advice and some of the observations of very young leaders in significant organizations um, in agriculture at a national level and at a local level as well. So Ag Shows Australia exists to provide support and guidance required by youth through their Emerging Leader Initiative um, so that you can focus on becoming involved to your the best of your ability in either these newly established organisations like we're seeing in WA um, or in the organisations that have been around for quite some time. We are so honoured tonight to have two wonderful young people who have achieved a huge amount in a short period of time um, on agricultural organisations and committees. In Tom Green, who is the chairman of Lachlan Valley Water, and if you Google him, you'll see that he's often dealing with ugly issues on TV um, in his very honest, raw way. Uh, he's a director and treasurer of the New South Wales Irrigators Council, uh, former vice president of Forbes Show Society, a former leader of the Royal Agricultural Societies of the Commonwealth Next Generation and a graduate of the AICD Company Directors course. And we also have the wonderful Danica Lees here, who you definitely will recognise from innumerable appearances on the drum and on all sorts of TV programs. Is the CEO of the Country Women's Association, a board member of Local Land Services, board member and founder of Ag Chat Oz and a board member of the New South Wales Council for Women's Economic Opportunity. And that's like 10% of what she does. So I'm not even going to go through the rest, but she might later on. Um, but we're going to start with you, Tom, and you might want to kind of take us back to the beginning. What was the first board you're on? Who tapped you on the shoulder? And then you can lead into some of the advice you have for these young people. No worries. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, yeah, look, um, and you know, everyone. Uh, I guess the first uh, experience I, I was in was um, actually the, the local show, Forbes show. So I was 16 or 17 when I joined the committee there after being involved in that organisation and um, have, have had a run at that. And, and uh, well, actually, you know, <laughs> can declare, resigned twice from that and, and currently not involved, uh, unfortunately. But um, yeah, plenty of other stuff happening um, in, in that space. And so tell me, um, we talked a lot about, um, you know, choosing when to leave a board as well. And I wonder if knowing this is going to be publicly available afterwards. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and not speaking specifically about Forbes Show Society, but where were the moments where you're like, this is no longer something I, I want to be necessarily on, or this is something I don't have time for anymore? Yeah, look, and, and starting off, I guess, yeah, it's um, one of those things where you need, you know, everyone can say, oh, you need to know when the time is to leave. Typically, it's um, if you can't go to sleep, <laughs> you're worrying about it, it's driving you crazy, or you're not enjoying it anymore. And if you, if you don't enjoy it, being a part of it, you, you start to drag it down yourself, I think. So, um, 
you've got to enjoy it and um, and have the support of others around, you know, within the organisation that um, also want you there, I think is an important thing and, and realising that. And so after the Forbes Show Society being so young involved in that committee, when was the next big appointment onto a committee or organisational board? Yeah, look, so uh, then I, uh, uh, when, you know, uh, we're farming at Forbes and also irrigating, so... I, uh, w our family was a member of, of Lachlan Valley Water and I went through, um, they were looking for young irrigators and I put my hand up for that and um, obviously had too much to say in the chair that had been there for 15 or 18 years and couldn't find anyone to replace him, quickly threw me under the bus at, uh, the, at a meeting a few years in and said, oh, you'll be right to be chair and I have been now for, for eight or nine years, so, um, but yeah, quite enjoyable. Do you, I'm going to couple, throw you a few more questions before we get to your advice. Yep. When um, when you first took on that chair appointment, you'd seen someone in the chair role, so you had something to kind of model yourself on. What were the core values you brought to that role as a chair or what were the quick lessons you learned early on chairing a meeting? Yeah, look, and, and it is always important and, and paying attention to how the chair is operating, uh, especially if you get in that, into that role. I think it's... Um, the biggest thing is realising you you sort of have to step back a little bit and um, you've got to listen to everyone and, and get everyone's opinion. Typically, if it's a full-on meeting, you're exhausted at the end of it because you're listening, taking in what everyone's saying, asking questions. Um, you might not be writing the minutes, but it becomes one of those things where um, you, you're sort of on the ball the whole time. And it's about... Um, being able to step back and, and hear everyone's advice and then take a position, uh, depending what organisation you're in, how, how do we move this forward? Because um, you'll find in a lot of things, uh, people can talk around in circles and um, it becomes that thing of going, right, we, we actually need to achieve something or, or what are we talking about? Why are we talking about it? I think um, anyone who's been on a things. committee, which is everyone here, will be going, oh, my God, yes, I've sat in on meetings where it's just swirling around issues and people are rambling and how do you as a chair cut through that respectfully yeah look and that's always the challenge is people say respectfully um often the easiest thing is to start off and and, and just say to everyone and, and and once you've been in the role for a little while uh you start to gain people's confidence and, and they know we all know how each other operate depending on the situation but you just say straight up, I'm going to be pretty hard in this and, and have to cut you down. If it's one of those really drawn out, let's keep things on topic. But I think it's just you keep asking the question, where are we get? How, how do you want me to take this forward as chair or how would you like the executive, uh, the employees to take this forward? Or are we actually going to develop a policy or we're just going to talk about it? Um, it, it, it can be sensitive because you've got to let everyone have their say and it's very important that people do. Um, but, you you know, there'll be someone on every committee that loves the sound of their own voice and will just keep talking and it, you've got to know when, when that's enough because everyone else in the room is expecting you to, to pull it up. <laughs> that's so true. So being a um, chair and a treasurer on a different council, you obviously have to have a serious understanding of governance. So you went and did the AICD course. Was that worthwhile for you? Yeah, look, and I, I've mentioned that there and, and that I'd sent through to you, Lindsay. And basically for that reason is if you do see that AICD to everyone listening and you have the opportunity to gain uh, funding or, or you do it, you pay for it yourself. It is quite expensive, the full course. Um, it's it's a fantastic course, and um, I, I gained a lot from it. Um, it the, the full company directors course is a week, and then you have to do assignments after it. But it, it really steps you back, and you go right. Yep, I sort of knew that, but it, it makes it very clear, and that this is why you're here, um, and making sure that you're doing everything that you need to, but also thinking a bit like a director or, or a committee member and, and stepping yourself back. Um, I should explain the acronym in case people are sitting there going, well, oh, yeah, sorry. Australian <laughs> Institute of Company Directors course. But Tom, I'm going to turn my screen off now and let you take over with your five pieces of advice. Thanks, Lindsay. 
Look, so I, I've written a heap of notes here and I, I think at the end of it, I'll probably end up with um, two pieces of advice, it's, uh, four words. But um, look, I'll just start off and, and look, I'm sure many of you have, have, have come across governance, heard of governance, you probably well across it. Um, you know, and I hate someone starting off with Google, but if you do Google it, it actually comes up with a really good, good definition. And it, it is, um, and, and looking at that very briefly, it's a system by what an organisation uh, is controlled by and how it operates. Um, and it's how people are held to account in that organisation. And it's whether it's risk management, ethics, legal compliance, administrative matters, um, they're all elements of it. And um, it's being across those, I guess. So, I, I, yeah, it's a, it's a good little one to, to sum it up. Um, and it really goes down to those roles and responsibilities um, of, as you, as directors, committee members, um, and, and why you're there and, and that you need to act in good governance. And that can be, you know, uh, both legal, uh, aspect, but also legal to the um, organisation. So, you know, the constitution is, is the legality of why that organisation exists. And it's really important that um, in, and especially show committees and so forth, why do you actually exist? And, and they can vary, obviously, but it may be for the benefit of agricultural, agricultural competition. That's your purpose and that's why you're there. And, and that comes back to the core of governance of, well, that, that's why we're here. We're not here for any other reason. Um, there are lots of side issues that'll feed into to that, but um, that, that's the, the intent and the purpose. I guess the best example that I've been given um, and is the entity or the organisation that you're a part of, you need to, to treat it or think of it as an orphan child that you're now legally responsible for. It can't make decisions for itself and it can't explain the decisions you make on its behalf. Um, so the first part is you, you're there to look after it. You know, you don't, can't make a decision that destroys you, you know, kills the child. It, you're, you're there for the benefit of that organisation and you need to treat it as though it, it, well, you know it can't make decisions, you're there for that reason. And it, it can't explain itself and that goes to communication and I have a little bit more on, on communication to say, look, financially, uh, there are legal requirements and then there'll be internal requirements um, of, of the various organisations. And it's often the one that you'll all come across first up uh, you know, the financial statements are moved each meeting. It'll have a, accounts review or audit at the end. They're all very important. Um, in, I suppose, in practice, two points is just because you're not the treasurer or not the chair or not the executive, it's your responsibility to know where the money's going. Your job sitting there in good governance is understanding the financial statements but also asking the questions if you're not sure. If you're not sure, you need to ask because if something does go wrong, you're in the box seat with everyone else. You, you, you're the, the legal, one of the legal guardians of the orphan. Um, people are going to ask, well, why didn't you know? Why didn't you do anything about that? Um, so it's just, oh, I left that to the treasurer. They should have told us. No, you, you need to be asking the questions, I guess, as, as a role of good governance in your organisation, if you're unsure. Um, and, and look, if you're in the treasurer's role, it's your responsibility, various responsibilities, but to provide those true and, and fair record of financial statements and be able to answer questions that people have got. Um, and also, it merges into a bit of a, uh, where you, you're in a little bit of the executive in that <clears throat> um, there, there's processes often around payments and, and the governance around that. The classic old example is the two signatories because everyone used to have checks and two people used to sign it. Unless that's written specifically in the constitution, 
there may be other policies and processes that are put in place when you sign accounts or, or do something. And that's just an example, I suppose I'm going to that, having been involved in various organisations in that role. Um, but it is, you, you know, I suppose it is often highlighted as governance because everyone's always interested in the money. Uh, look, moving on, the next bit of advice, I suppose, is conflicts, um, conflicts of interest. Uh, and, and they go to committee practice uh, or meeting practice, but you need to understand when you've got an, a, uh, a declaration to make or not. And if you're not sure, ask someone um, and you're always better to flag it than someone bring it up later and say, hold on, you, you benefited from this decision financially and personally. Um, why wasn't that noted? Or you may be employed by someone um, or a company that um, is sponsoring a show and you've got to remember and, and move straight into the next bit if, is which hat you're wearing uh, and, and that can as you get on to different boards and so forth you have to it's probably the most important is remembering which hat you put on and you know tonight I'm wearing my own hat just Tom Green um, I'm not here representing any other organisation I'm, I'm wearing that hat. Uh, if, and, and that, it just becomes really important, uh, especially in communications and media. And if, if all of a sudden you're in that position or you're asked to comment on something, is one, why are they asking you? And, and if they're asking you because you wear a particular hat, well, make sure you've got permission to wear that hat to do that. But also remember you're wearing that hat, not your personal opinion, not uh, another organisation you're involved in, um, if you're there representing X, you, you need to say that um, and make that clear. It's always better to make it clear. I mean, if I have them, we're running at minor flood at Forbes at the moment. If I have a media inquiry as chair of Lock and Valley Water tomorrow, um, I'll always say my title is you know, Tom Green, chair of Lock and Valley Water, because I'm speaking on behalf of that. Unless someone may ring and say, oh, we want a farmer's perspective. Well, then I need to manage how that is, how that is betrayed. Oh, I might be better to say, look, find someone else because people know me as the chair and may not delineate. Um, so it's always better to declare those things. Look, so managing the hat that you're wearing, I'd say is one of the really big things. Uh, you heard last week and look, I, I listened in after um, on the recording Lynn sent me and, um, it was fantastic. Uh, look, a bit of advice on committees, and they, they come across it last week. You're always going to come across people on there for self-purpose. Someone will be on there, not for the greater good of the organisation, but to get themselves somewhere. Look, if they're following good governance, it's pretty hard to get rid of them. Um, and often they probably will be. The biggest, the best advice I can give is don't be one of those people. Um, be there for the greater good of that organisation where you had, um, where you need to, um, in 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 being a part of that organisation, and just do the best you think can, because I think they spent like last week. Opportunities will come up if if you're yourself and you just do a good job, um, and certainly through some of the stuff I've been, been involved in, those opportunities arise, such as the RASC of the Commonwealth, um, in in just participating and. You don't have to um, be there trying to promote yourself. You're just there for the greater good of that. And, and if you do a good job at that, you'll you'll get picked up in, in various roles. Look, um, leaving just very quickly with a bit of advice otherwise is stuff always goes wrong, especially shows, races, doesn't matter what you're involved in, stuff goes wrong. Typically, it's not the end of the world. My advice is make sure the organ you're flagging it. If it's so have the policies, the procedures, the processes in place. Some sometimes it's unforeseen, but there is always stuff that will be flagged. Just make sure that you've done your due diligence. The organisation's gone through the processes that it needed to legally, or or the processes it had set through its own policies to get there. Um, 
because there's nothing worse when someone's, you know, that's where it can get ugly is where um, things haven't been followed. And that comes back to financials, people not checking. Did you have authority to do that? Someone doing an interview and going, uh, hold on, there's a communications policy that these three people are the people meant to be doing it. That, that's where that governance and policy and process comes in place. I guess, look, the two, uh, the two tips that I started off with and have come around to is uh, with governance, be aware. So be aware of what you're getting yourself into, what the organisation's doing, what's happening within the organisation, where's the money going, are people doing what they should. You're not there to be an investigator, but be aware. You've got to have knowledge of um, an understanding of what's happening. And the other one is just to practice good governance. Um, you know, remember which hat you're wearing. Um, if you've got a conflict, declare it. Um, look, I think I've covered it off probably. <laughs> Talked a lot of uh, jumble there, Linz, but hopefully there's something that so comes across. <laughs> No, Tom, thank you so much. There's so many just really tangible pieces of advice there. And I'm going to ask everyone now to throw their questions forward either in the chat and I can read them out or we'd prefer you to throw your hand up virtually and um, and we'll unmute you and you can turn your camera on and ask Tom a question directly. But while people are thinking of their questions, um, you mentioned uh, finances and your obligations and as a print journalist, I'm not naturally very numerically minded, but I sit on quite a few boards and panels. And um, Catherine Marriott gave us great advice last week to approach things, not in an acrimonious or adversarial way, but in it with curiosity. And I find that uh, it's not the most dignified way to do it, but I say on boards, I'll look, you know, I'm not the numbers person, but can someone explain that to me? Or how does that work? Or does that really normally cost that much? And just the gentle question is enough of a probe. And I'm sure everyone involved in a show here has watched a show fall into financial ruin because people just didn't ask questions because they thought it wasn't their bag. And the reality is if you're on the com on the committee, it is absolutely your bag to gently ask the questions in a public forum and not wait until you're having a beer at the bar with someone from the committee afterwards, but ask it in the forum where it's being minuted um, and maybe pull someone up from what could be quite an innocent or silly mistake that could cost the show society quite a bit. So very keen to take three or four questions now for Tom, who's diving in first. And everyone to quiet. <laughs> oh, Ashley's here from Melbourne Royal. Great to have you here, Ash. Anna Ferguson's on. Yeah, I did. Turn that camera on, Ed. Show that handsome face. Yeah, no, Ed, look, I think it's, yeah, and especially when you chair, look, if you chair, it's probably easier. What it is is making sure because the conversation is going flat out that you've got it written down or, or a note to yourself. Who hasn't spoken? And, and often it's just asking or asking a question, um, you know, how does this affect you, such and such, uh, or 
yeah, you know, asking for that opinion. And I know that's really easy to say. And look, when you're the chair, it's, I would say the biggest thing is just remembering that you do do it and, and bring everyone forward. Um, if you're a committee member, uh, it might be using an example, you know, and saying, look, yeah, but, but how does that affect you or your, your in the show? Is that going to affect your situation, you know, to, to a steward or someone in a different section and all of a sudden that they've got, a, oh, yeah, no. And if it's no and they don't want to say anymore, well, they had their opportunity. The encouragement's the hard bit and it, I guess that's making the room comfortable um, and that's everyone acting respectfully but also the chair having a handle on, on the situation. Tom, if I could add to that, I just um, finished up a two-year tenure with Australian Wool Innovations Wool Grower Panel. And we started off, I think, with seven panellists and it grew to 10. And the meetings often go for eight hours. And I was super aware that there are wonderful vocal contributors, extroverted, lots to say, very involved in agri-politics. And they had really fabulous contributions. And there would be people in the meeting who naturally would really not speak up and um I got to the point where I would build myself a little table before each meeting and write agenda item one and have all of their names across the top, agenda item two, all of their names across the top and literally go to the point of, Carla, I'd like to hear your opinion on this. Oh, you don't have one, that's okay. Joshua, did you have an opinion on this? Hazel, uh, Sarah Hazel, we haven't heard from you yet. And just, the, just those little segues to people and you're dead right. If they opt out and say, no, that's fine, but extending the invitation and Catherine Marriott spoke a lot last week about... Um, giving introverts the, the opportunity to contribute the way they best contribute, which is with a bit of thinking time, silence, pensiveness, and an invitation. Um, and I thought that was, that was really great advice too. Any other questions for Tom? You're off the hook lightly, Tom. <laughs> Good. I'm going to get you to stay online, though, because we might get yep. some questions with Danika's um, presentation that you'll be able to jump in on as well. I'm very keen um, to have you involved in that conversation. Danika Lees, what an enormous career you have had. You are such a young, national, formidable leader in so many spaces. Where was What was your first board appointment? Oh, you're very kind. Um, my first board appointment was probably thinking back on it, um, on the parent committee of the Rainbow Cottage Daycare Centre at Dubbo. <laughs> so, um, you know, started back then, but my first, um, I suppose, like official paid board appointment was probably just recently with um, Greater Sydney Local Land Services. Uh, but, uh, yeah, have worn a few different hats. Tom spoke about, you know, the different hats that, that people wear, um, and I still wear quite a few. I love that you can come young. Thank you very much. <laughs> very very flattering so um yeah and happy to be here tonight thanks Lindsay. beautiful i'm going to jump off screen and let you dive into your tips thank you thank you um well first of all can i just say yeah thank you very much again for having me and um i think for all of you on the line you know what a great opportunity that you have that Lindsay has pulled together i did listen to uh some of the um some of the contributions from Catherine or Maz, as I call her, she's a very good friend of mine last week, as well as um, Jock, who Jock has been um, a, an amazing mentor to me as well in various different iterations of his career over the years. So it was so great to listen to them and listen to their very, very frank and candid contributions. Um, I when we were, when I was talking to Lindsay the other day about um, coming on to talk about, you know, my pieces of advice and things like that, I think increasingly people like me and, you know, my, my colleagues and my friends that work in um, various different leadership roles in the industry, you know, we, we just actually, we all say the same thing in that we actually really want to be very open um, and some and sometimes even vulnerable about you know the challenges that we've faced as individuals in our careers and we still face as well um, and not sugarcoat um, some of those things that we come up against and just yeah just be really open with you so very happy to take take your questions um Lindsay's already touched on some of the things that I do um, my day-to-day -day is mostly filled up with uh my role with CWA of New South Wales so I'm the CEO of the, of the Country Women's Association of New South Wales so from a governance point of view um I'm actually on the other side of the ledger so to speak I'm very much more in the operational team so I have a board that I report to the board of the CWA of New South Wales is actually very large 38 people make up my board which is 
uh, as I said, from a government point of view, extremely large and has a lot of different challenges. So uh, operates quite well, quite functional. Uh, and, you know, we do a lot of good things. But yeah, from that size point of view, a lot, a lot of different things that we um, that we work on to be to make sure that we have really efficient processes in place. Um, and one of those things is that we make sure that that board has governance training every single year so that understand what their role is. And I suppose that relates to my first piece of advice is that um, in any kind of board, whether it's a volunteer board and a lot of you will be involved um, through the show movement in volunteer type boards and committees or even moving up to, um, you know, paid board roles um, if you're not involved already at some point in the future. Um, I think the advice is the same. It doesn't matter just because you're on a volunteer uh, board or committee, it doesn't mean that governance rules apply to you in any lesser sense. So you do have to take responsibility um, as a board director um, for all the things that Tom talked about when he was giving his advice. But I think, yeah, first, first piece of advice is understanding your role and your role is actually to make decisions, to help make decisions that uh, for the benefit of the whole organization so that's something that we bring up quite a lot in CWA when we've got 38 people um, who come to the board because they come from a certain area of the state but actually when they come into that board environment they're there to make decisions for the for the betterment of the whole association they're not there to fly the flag for their particular area although the experience and insights that they bring from their particular area are really important Ultimately, at the end of the day, they do need to make a decision about, um, yeah, that's based on what their understanding of what is best for the whole organisation. So I think from that's really important thing to keep remembering when you're in that situation. Uh, just, I mean, boring stuff like insisting on good minutes and clear action items, I think is very, very important. Um, it's It can save a lot of heartache down the track. It can make sure that everyone's on track with what it is that you want to be focused on moving forward. Um, so whilst the role of the secretary is probably, you know, one that, you know, whenever, whenever we're in a situation where a branch or a group or something is doing um, office bearers elections, you know, you don't bet people jumping out of their seats saying, oh, yes, I'll be the secretary because it's it's pretty hard role. Like it's, it's probably... Um, I'd say in some respects, it's probably actually a harder role than the president because of the amount of work that you are doing in terms of taking minutes and getting action lists out there. Um, but it's a great role to do uh, to really understand what it is um, that your committee or board is working on. You know, you, you as a secretary will have um, so much intimate knowledge of everything that's going on because of that, because of that role. So yeah, choose the secretary as well, but even yourself consider taking on that secretary role as part of your um, experience. Uh, the, my third piece of advice is in relation, well, when we do our board training with the CWA of New South Wales board, um, we recently had a lady called Fiona Shand who comes along and she's fantastic with her training, um, but she often says to them the acronym NIFO, N-I-F-O, and that she wants them to have their noses in and fingers out. So she wants them to have um, a very healthy curiosity about all manner of different things that are going on within CWA, but not to get bogged down in the operational aspects of things that, um, that we might be doing, myself and my staff might be doing. Um, I still think that's relevant advice. I know for a lot of you, it, you know, it, it's a little bit different because you're on a volunteer board where you're also then often being given jobs to go and execute yourself. You don't have staff members that you can just delegate a job to. Many of you will be doing those jobs yourself. But I think it's good advice in the sense that if there is a designated person to do a job, it's the board's role to give that person, you know, guidance, boundaries, so to speak. Here's the paddock, go and play in the paddock. We'll, we'll set the fences up um, and let that person go and do what it is that they need to do um, to execute whatever it is that they need to do. Lost how many pieces of ice I'm up to now. I'm just looking at my notes. Um, and then I suppose my last couple of pieces of advice are more around just advice for you uh, personally when you're um, on a board. Uh, set boundaries for yourself, I think. Learn when to say no, um, but also understand that not everything on a board and committee can be fun. Like, you know, not everybody can run the social media or build the website or do the fun things like that. 
some people just have to do get in the trenches and do the, the hard graft. But at the same time, look after yourself. And um, particularly, I know many of you are young people on the call. Uh, what I see happening, I see it happening in CWA, and I'm sure the same happens in the show movement as well. Um, you know, older people who have been on these committees for a long, long time, they are tired and they are exhausted, but they see young people put their hand up and want to come forward and be involved. And, you know, your first meeting, you'll walk in and get given five jobs because, you know, you're the fresh blood in the in the room, so to speak. Um, don't be afraid to set boundaries in relation to that and just be just take on what it is that you're that you're comfortable taking on. Uh, and um my last piece of advice is probably, I get asked a lot about, um, and this is not so much a governance issue, but um, I think it does in some ways relate to governance. I get asked a lot about, um, you know, oh, work-life balance, how do you manage all of your different things that you do in your family and, you know, your volunteer commitments, because I'm involved in some volunteer organisations as well. And I think perhaps giving for me, I think giving up on the idea of work-life balance and actually knowing that it's a bit of a pendulum and sometimes it swings a bit, you know, to the work or the volunteer side of things and sometimes it'll swing back to the family side of things. As long as that pendulum is actually swinging back and forth and isn't just like entrenched in one side or the other for too long, then that's okay. But you're never actually going to have that perfect equilibrium where everything's fine everything's perfect you've done the perfect minutes no spelling mistakes you've sent them out to everybody's email list and you've not made a mistake on everybody's email and everything's all but it's just not going to happen so you know it's a bit it's a bit messy from time to time but I think give it your best shot um and you know that's yeah I, I think near enough is good enough give up on the idea of perfection and that work-life balance that is very sage advice, I think, Danica. I'm going to throw a question at you first and hope that a couple of others come through with their own. But you are a founder of Ag Chat Oz, that amazing online community that is so prolific on Twitter and elsewhere, and I absolutely love it for being abreast of what's going on in the world of ag. Um, there's a couple of groups here that are representing new bodies or bodies that have perhaps dissolved over the years and are going to reform. What's your advice for starting an entity and getting it right from the beginning? Yeah, um, and good question because I think getting it right from the beginning will have a bearing on you know how successful that entity is going to be. I think you really need to think about um, what I think. Well, first of all, one of the clear clear things that you need to get clear in your mind is is this a state or a national? Um, entity that you're wanting to to get off the ground because they're two different very pathways two two very different pathways from a governance point of view depending on if it's a state or a or a national entity um, it's not always possible when things are in the fledgling stages but if you can go and get the legal advice and even I would suggest the accounting advice to to help set you up um, in the right way to go forward uh, most often as well when you are setting up a new entity depending on which way you're going it will involve you know you're approaching some people to be part of your inaugural board because there are requirements for instance um, to set up a not-for-profit or a charity uh, that you have a certain number of people on your board so think really carefully about who you ask to do those things for you um, but at the same time don't be reluctant to ask someone that you think oh, well, I'd love to have that person on my board, but there's no way they would ever consider doing that. You might be surprised. Um, you know, really, you know, go for the people that you really, really want to be on your board because, again, they will have a huge bearing on the success or otherwise of that entity going forward. Um, I'd probably also just say, you know, Tom mentioned it, I think, at the start of his talk, um, and it was a bit like that with Ag Chat Oz. You know, you run things for a long, long time, but you also have to know when it is to step away. And when, if you're in the beginning stages of something and you get it off the ground and you get it going, or, you know, it's something that you're um, reinvigorating after a long time of it being quiet, it's really hard after, you know, it, it could be a big chunk of time, you know, that could be a five year project, but it could be really hard after that time to walk away. But, um, Keep that in mind, you know, what the succession plan is going forward for that entity. 
I'm curious to ask both you and Tom. So Tom, get ready to answer this. Do you have, um, you've mentioned that you've been mentored at some point, but have you had mentors for different stage in your career? How did you approach them? What is the role of a mentor um, when you're sitting on a board? Yeah, look, for me, it's been um, a little bit more informal in terms of when I talk about people that have been a mentor. For me, they've just been people in my life, um, be it um, particularly in my professional life, but sometimes in my personal life that I um, really trust and I have considered, you know, as leaders in their field, but have also, I can go to and talk to um, about anything really. So um, I mentioned before, you know, Jock was one of those and, and still is one of those, you know, I, we don't, I don't ring Jock up and say, can I have a mentoring session? Like I might just see him at the Royal Easter show or I'll see him at some event and we'll have a chat about different things. Um, and, you know, there's been others along the way um, in those leadership roles. Sometimes it's it could be my boss or, um, or, or at the current time, uh, you know, a bit of a tangent but related to mentors is also the importance of having a really small group of people I have two people I won't mention who they are but I have two people who are heavily involved in the industry and um, they both have leadership positions in the industry and and I've worked with them in various different forms over the years and we have like a little three-way group chat but they're just three the three of us we can just talk about anything um, and we can call each other out on our bullshit as well um, and say well I saw you in the media saying this that was a bit crap or you know maybe you should think of you know doing this this way um, so having that for me those two people um, have been and I know they say the same thing about me as well, um, have been really, really um, important and valuable. And I have enough professional and personal distance from them in, in my day to day that I actually can have those very frank conversations because I'm not seeing them all the time, if that makes sense. So I think mentoring is great, but also having, you know, a couple of really trusted people that you can that you can have, a, you know, that relationship with where you can talk about anything. Love it. And Tom, how, what's your position on mentoring? Do you have one? Um, well, I look, a, a little bit like uh, the nigga, it um, has been, for me, much more informal. Um, have, didn't have sort of that, I um, don't know if it was that popular when I started out uh, to have a mentor. But uh, look, I think if, if the opportunity arises for people, certainly, um, even if it's just brief, take it. Um, but again, mine was, yeah, a little bit more informal. I was lucky in one position where... It, one organisation I sat on that was a member of another organisation, I sat as an observer on the top organisation for a number of years and, and got to observe the meeting and, and understand and work out the process. And you get to meet people in that informal setting that are in those roles and um, you may not have, be having a direct conversation with them about something at times. You may well be um, about governance or, or how to process, how to do something, but... Um, it may just be those informal things as well where, where you start to pick it up. Um, but, you know, as I said before, if, if the opportunity arises, training is great, experience is, is great as well. And, and either one or both, I would suggest, if, if you get the opportunity on either, take both of them um, because it, it's certainly worthwhile. I would recommend to anyone if you get the opportunity or you see a window to ask to be just an observer on a committee discussion or a um, or a board meeting, it's a rare thing to be able to see. It's a really valuable opportunity to just sit back and absorb it all and see how people operate and just see the, the structure of a well-run meeting as well. Speaking of well-run meetings, I've seen minutes look so different with different organizations and different secretariats and different committees like I've seen almost verbatim minutes that are so hard to understand I've seen minutes that are so short they're missing context Tom and Danica what constitutes good versus bad minutes as far as you're concerned and um, what's the time frame for getting them out? What's, what's oh, the deadline? Good question. Yeah, and I look, I've seen all those minutes as well. We have about 370 branches in New South Wales, and um, I'm not personally responsible for all of their minutes, but I do, see, I do see a lot of different minutes come through. And um, 
and you know we get questions from new secretaries as well who want to make sure that they're doing the right thing in relation to their minutes so um and i think minute taking is a bit of an art form in that but the more you do it the more you um, get better at it and it's somewhere in between it's definitely not a transcript as you mentioned so we don't want to see um you know like a hands-on transcript of what goes on in a meeting word for word um fair enough if a secretary wants to sort of take those notes to be able to you know then use for themselves to form some minutes later absolutely fair enough um, but we also don't want to see as you said, like a few scratchings on a piece of paper. Yep, these people were here. Can't remember if that person was here or not. Oh, maybe they were an apology. Not sure. Um, yep, and we endorsed some money being spent here. Um, you know, we, so I think a good set of minutes is is something in between. Um, ultimately, it has to be an accurate and true reflection of um, the decisions that went on in the meeting. Um, perhaps a little bit of background about those decisions. Um, you don't have to necessarily explain that you know, this person said this and this person had this viewpoint and this person had this viewpoint. Um, it is it is a it is a document that someone who hasn't been in the meeting can actually pick up, read and understand what went on in the meeting and what decisions were made. So um, that's my comment on minutes. Thank you, Tom. And then we'll go to Larry. Yeah, look, I, I completely agree with that. It's um, that they've got to be true and fair record. Uh, but they need to be concise. Um, it, I suppose, yeah, an adding would be where it's appropriate, if put some context around it, because otherwise someone will read it in the future. And it's also with policies that people often forget is, is, is why, why did the organisation do this? And there could be really good reasons. And if it's not document, uh, just a little bit of documentation in minutes or you know, a bit of a preamble into a policy of why this exists, it gets, it can get thrown out, things change, and all of a sudden something falls to pieces in the organisation and it's like, oh, that's why they did that. So that's a little bit I'd add, I, I suppose, is, um, yep, they need to be concerned. It is an art. Um, I'm glad I don't write them. <laughs> And so the only other thing I forgot to add there is, I mean, some of the best minutes I've seen um, actually also have associated with them are just a separate action list that just lives meeting to meeting that you're just pulling out of the minutes, you know, the actions that were decided on and then who's responsible for who. And then each meeting, you're just bringing up the action list as well as the minutes, you know, has this been done? Yes, no, do we carry it on? You know, so having that separate little action table is a really, really good idea. Thank you. Larry, what's your question? Sure. Um, well, I think AICD is being mentioned a couple of times um, and that's the Australian Institute of Company Directors and they really are probably like the gold star um, option if that's available to you either through, you know, there, there, there are some different scholarships that come up from time to time for AICD. I was lucky enough I was actually able to do it through the Rural Women's Award um, because I just wouldn't, you know, I mean, even now I wouldn't be able to afford to just go and pay um, to do that. It is very expensive. Um, I, knew, I do know some people that have chosen to pay for it themselves and go and do it and they still think it's worthwhile. So um, AICD is definitely um, a really good one. Um, but there are a whole host of other lower cost options out there in relation to governance. Um, we we work, um, and this is not a plug, it's just an option for you to go and have a look at. We work a lot with Natalie Bramble in Dubbo, who runs um, some online governance training, and it's uh, she's got it all set up there specifically for associations and not-for-profits, um, uh, and it's called I Click to Learn, but there's there's lots of different options out there to go and to go and have a look. Um, just I suppose make sure that you look for something that's you know very much written in sort of the Australian context um, and uh, you know is 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 
uh, even preferably if it's geared towards not-for-profits and charities, um, that, that would be better um, as well. And so what was, there was two questions for the other question. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I think it. Um, and Tom may have some views as well, but I, I think it depends on you know how how you best work as a person. Like for me, I didn't sort of. I was a bit like you. I didn't want to go and just approach someone and have that formal mentoring relationship. Um, but I had um, and have had over time, you know, a network of people that I can go and speak to and just have a, and just say, look, could I have a coffee with you? I've just got a few things I want to bounce off you, um, you know, in terms of, you know, X, Y, Z, whatever it might be. I actually never have said to anyone, um, you know, will you be my mentor? Um, but I'm sure if I did, they probably would have said yes. So, I mean, don't don't be shy in, um, you know, it's a, it's an honour really like to be asked to, to help someone in that regard. Um, and, you know, people will be honest with you about whether they have the time, the resources, they, they will most often always make the time and it might just be like a one-off, have a chat, have a coffee and talk about some issues, but that's, but that's valuable. It doesn't have to be like a formal ongoing thing, but if that works for you and your mentor, then yeah, encourage that as well. Um, Tom? Yeah, no, uh, thanks for the, for the question. Uh, <coughs> first one, yep, yeah, uh, you know, there's AICD there. Uh, look, there's a number out there. Associations Forum is one that, that I personally, we haven't used, but it's, um, I think you, you pay a membership fee and, and then you can, um, you know, there's available training and, and to the committee and board. Um, and look, if you can find somewhere good, it, it's something, one of those things that um, the whole committee should, you, you should have it every so often, um, just a bit of a refresher because people forget why they're there. <laughs> they can be there short time or a long time and all of a sudden, it's like, yeah, that's, but we're here for this purpose. Um, and, you know, they, those little things, whether it's governance, roles, responsibilities, they all merge into one. Uh, it, it is really worth um, even some people, you know, people know people that, are, that do a bit of governance training or something, just getting them to speak at a committee meeting can often be good, just so everyone hears it. And it's a good reminder, all of those little things. Um, and one of the things I did actually forget, and, and it comes back to this, and is um, people often um, don't, you know, uh, step away. So in camera would be one of governance in, in saying, you know, staff step out and do it every meeting. You know, that's sort of I suppose, throwing it in that there'll be things that those, those organisations will sort of raise for you. Um, and Mentors, look, I can't help you. I don't know. I, I often, I think, as was said before, you'll get to know people and you'll ask them, and it's probably not the comment to say, "Will you be my mentor?" But um, you'll get to know people, and and look at that straight up opportunity, and it is more common now. You'll come across in in organisations that provide mentors or whatever. Certainly, um, I'd take it up and and see what they've got to add. Thank you so much for your question, Larry. Um, Danica and Tom, I'm going to ask you to leave us all with one sentence that you want to stick in the minds of the 40 odd people on this uh, webinar tonight. But while you're thinking of that, I'm just letting you all know that next week we've got our final session and it is on leadership. And by default of being on here, you are demonstrating enormous personal leadership. And uh, we have two really interesting figures in agricultural and rural entities, entities um, coming on next week. So John Bennett is very well known to anyone involved with Sydney Royal. He's not only the vice president of the Royal Agricultural Society of New South Wales, he's also the ringmaster, um, or has been for many years up until recently, the ringmaster of the whole show. And it's the largest ticketed event in Australia. 
So he deals with lots of subcommittees, lots of different parties, and has to demonstrate enormous leadership. Um, he is also a chair of several local groups and has been very involved with his local show society, the Nowra Show Society. So he'll bring us lots of tangible advice from a show lens. And we've also managed to lock in Anna Spear, who is so famous in rural circles. Uh, she's got a swag of awards for being this extraordinary leader. And if you haven't listened to her podcast on humans of agriculture, do yourself a favour. That is, as Danika said, that is like raw, honest leadership reflection, um, totally unashamedly, Anna. And it's so refreshing that that's the new leaders in, in our industry going forward. Um, she's currently the CEO of one of Woolworth's um, new entities, which is called Greenstock. It's a focus on end-to-end -end sustainable cattle um, production, paddock to plate kind of stuff. She is a former director of Agribusiness Australia. She's a member of the CSIRO Future Protein Mission. Similarly to these guys, she's got a CV as long as I am tall, um, but they are wonderful speakers to finish this session off for us next week. So we hope you all join us. And it's the same link every week, by the way. So Tom, your one sentence that you want everyone to remember from the session tonight. Know what governance is, be aware of it, and then put it make put it into practice. Succinct as always, <laughs> and a few words, but they're always good words. And Danica Lees, you're taking us out. Oh wow, the pressure's on. Uh, well, my advice is probably not much around governance, but the sentence is around you know. Um, and very, very grateful to be be here tonight. But um, I think we need we need you all to be yourselves. So um, happy to share our knowledge and our insights and our advice. Um, but don't aspire to be like anyone else. Just aspire to be the best version of yourself. Beautifully said from both of you. Um, thank you, everyone, for giving us an hour of your time. Uh, you've all got huge futures ahead of you, both in uh, the agricultural show movement and beyond, and hopefully this is contributing uh, to the development of who you'll be on that stage. Look forward to seeing you all next week. Have a good night.